I was about 17 at the time. At my boyfriend's house, we were watching a movie and we both fell asleep. Not like today with Netflix and chill, we actually fell dead asleep and by the time I woke up, it was almost 3 a.m. and my curfew was officially blown. This was pre-cell phone days, so I had no way to call home and explain. I just had to drive home and face the music. If I knew my mom, she would be waiting for me. My boyfriend walked me out. It was chilly on my skin, which was still warm with sleep. He kissed me goodbye and told me to drive safely. I grew up in a suburb in Northern California. Safety was never really an issue, and the way home was familiar and well lit. I got in my sweet, sweet S10 and started on my way. I was thankful that my dad had reminded me to gas up before I went to my boyfriend's house because I could get straight home without stopping. My dad was, and still is, very type A. He had been on my case lately because I was doing a very poor job at vehicle maintenance. My tires recently had to be replaced because they were extremely worn and dangerous. My dad was mad that I didn't notice and was driving around when it was unsafe. Well, 17 year old girl, sorry. So my penance was a lot of reminders about gas, oil changes, car washing and the like. I was nervous and distracted because I knew I was in trouble. I just wanted to get home and get it over with. I got on the road between my house and my boyfriend's house, which ran east to west right through the city. I began to drive westbound home. I was about halfway up the long road when I stopped at a red light just under an overpass. In my periphery, I saw a large van pull up next to me in the other lane. I wasn't really paying attention until I saw the driver gesticulating wildly to get my attention. I looked over at the man and felt my stomach contract and go liquid all at once. His eyes. Predatory, but not in an earthly way, if that makes sense. He wasn't a bunt or a kemper. He was more like the one that whispered in those guys' ears and told them what to do and how. His eyes were blue, but they made me feel black. He motioned for me to roll down my window. Everything told me no, no, don't do that. But a different part of my brain told me it was very important that he not realize that I know about him. So I saw, not felt, my hand reach for the window crank. I saw the window go down. He smiled and it made me feel sick to my stomach. He said, I'm glad I caught you. Your tire is flat. You should pull over and I can help you change it. Right up there, that gas station. Lots of light so I can see what I'm doing. He offered a smile, but although it sounds trite, it did not touch his eyes. It was like he was grinding his facial muscles into what he thought a smile should look like. No comfort there. It made my insides feel like cold jelly. I thought for a minute, flat tire. I didn't even feel the car shimmy once. And then I remember that my tires are no more than two weeks old. He was trying to catch me all right but not to help with a tire. And the gas station that he pointed to was well lit, but it was also closed. There was no attendant standing guard, just an empty station under the lights. Anything could happen, even under the lights, especially with this man thing. I quickly said, no, that's fine. I don't live far and rolled up my window. I looked away, but then I could see him waving his arms at me again and I could hear muffled yelling. I glanced over out the side of my eyes and I could see he was angry, beyond angry. He was screaming at me and a spittle was flying out of his mouth and landing on his windows. I could see him moving as if to get out of the car and I decided to just gun it. It was 3 a.m. and there were few cars, if any, and at this point, I would welcome being pulled over by the cops. I scream out from under the overpass and up the street. I don't look back in the rear view. I'm too scared. Then, headlights in my rear view, and honking. He's right behind me. Instead of heading straight, I decided to turn left abruptly, taking an alternate route to my house. Also, my oldest brother lived that way and worst case, I would just pull into his driveway and lay on the horn. Plus, I don't want that thing to know the way I usually take it home. My heart stopped as I saw the van behind me take the left too. No longer honking, but still flashing the lights. I was on the precipice of hysteria when I saw my brother's house down the block. I pulled over in front of his driveway and started honking the horn. Damn the neighbors. The van pulled up behind me and stopped momentarily until the lights in my brother's living room window went on. Then the van took off up the street, passed under the last visible streetlight and disappeared into the dark. 
I stared at the dark place where the van vanished until I realized that my brother was shaking me. He came around and opened my door to see if I was all right. He was yelling at me, asking what happened, if I was okay. I started to cry. I couldn't speak. He took me inside to call my parents. When my parents arrived, I told them about how I fell asleep, about how I was driving home when this man tried to make me pull over because he said I had a flat tire, how I got scared and took off up the street and about how he chased me. I didn't tell them that I didn't think he was a man at all. Just something from a dark hole in reality somewhere pretending to be a man. And he knew, I knew. He knew it as soon as I sped away against the red light. That's why he was so angry. I had the audacity to know. I've long since moved away from my hometown, but I still think about that night. I hope I never see another being like that again. My aunt and uncle went out of town for two weeks for an anniversary slash vacation. They had a chocolate lab at the time named Lola. Instead of taking her to a kennel any time they would leave, which was pretty often, they would ask me to take care of Lola and house it. It's a huge house, nearly 20,000 square feet, and it's in a very rich area and neighborhood. The home was actually designed customed by my uncle about 15 years before my experience. Since their neighbor down the street was robbed when they were on vacation, they wanted me there to make sure no one would try breaking in. Every time I would house slash dox it, I would have weird feelings. But I chalked it up to being alone in a huge house because I'm used to a very small house that you can see almost everywhere from the living room. However, nothing that noticeable would happen. I would hear noises like creaks and bumps, etc. But I logically concluded it's just the house making noises or the HVAC system or the water heater. So I never paid too close attention to it, even though at the time it was startling. This was for about one week and a few long weekends here and there over about a nine month period. However, right after the holidays, they went on their two week vacation when this all happened. I would always stay over just so I can let Lola out late at night before bed and right when I woke up and also to deter any possible break-ins. I had a system that would make it look like I'm there or more than one person was there. I would routinely switch lights on and off, upstairs, main floor, basement, different bedrooms, and hallway lights. I would always keep track of which ones I had on, since I would choose two different ones for everything I left. I was in community college at the time and had a big social life, so I would be in and out most of the day into the evening. The first few days, the normal noises happened as they have in the past. They put me on edge, but didn't necessarily scare me. After the first few days, I started to notice some strange things. Certain lights I knew I left on were then turned off, and others turned on. To be honest, I just thought I was stressed out and it's a big house and it's not a big deal. Until one night, I left almost every light on in the main floor and went out to pick up some pizza up for dinner. When I came back to the house, every single light was then turned off. And since this was winter in Northern Illinois, when I got back around six, it had already been dark for over an hour. So no lights being on was very noticeable. This is when I started getting genuinely creeped out. I grabbed a baseball bat and searched everywhere in the house, down to even their safe rooms in the back of their closets to make sure there was no intruder. Lola would follow me around the house, but I could tell by her body language and actions that she was stressed. After searching the house and finding absolutely nothing, I watched TV and pizza, then went to bed. I would always sleep in their sunroom on a chase lounge because it was in a secluded corner of the house. I felt way too weird to sleep in any of my cousin's bed, so I would always sleep in that sunroom. That night is when Lola started growling. She would look through the doorway, it was a glass door, and growl. I would try to get her to stop and see if she needed anything, but she never did. The preceding few nights, Lola's behavior changed. She was very anxious. And at about night five in a two weeks day, I started hearing footsteps. Lola would of course growl or bark when she heard this. I went straight to thinking it was an intruder and searched the whole house again and again, nothing. I wanted to call the cops, but I didn't want any word to come back to my aunt and uncle because they would pay me a ton of money to do this for them while they were away. And as a broke college student, I would do just about anything. 
This continued to the next few nights. The footsteps went from one footstep sound to like five seconds worth. With a couple nights remaining, activity started to escalate. More noises than usual, including footsteps. This all culminated on the very last night. I came back from class around 7 p.m. and it was pitch black outside. I walked in from the side door over pristine white tile and weirdly, Lola did not greet me at the door like she always does. I went to look for her and she was shaking in her dog bed. I had a super eerie feeling and just wanted to leave. I was just going to take Lola back home with me and drop her off the next morning before my aunt and uncle returned. However, before leaving, I had to go downstairs to feed their cat and change its litter box. The cat always stayed down there because Lola would scare the crap out of the poor thing. They have a baby gate with the white wire mesh in the middle, separating the upstairs and downstairs at a landing halfway down the stairs. While cleaning the litter box, I hear the baby gate fall and distinctly hear the sound of the mesh rattling back and forth. If you've ever had one of these gates, I'm sure you know the sound I'm talking about. My heart felt like it sank to my stomach and I was filled with dread. At this time, I hear loud footsteps upstairs and then hear Lola bark and run. And that's when I just called it and was out of there. I headed up the stairs and when I got to the baby gate, it was still standing up against the wall, but definitely not where I left it. I got Lola and went towards the mudroom where the white tile is that I walked through when coming in the house from the side door. And the first thing I noticed was muddy boot prints. It was something you could not miss because it was one half an inch thick mud plumps in the shape of huge boots, far bigger than my size 12 gym shoes. These boot prints were coming from the garage entrance to this room, not the side entrance. Added to this, it was January and well below freezing with a few inches of snow on the ground. There was no mud anywhere. Everything was covered in snow. I freaked out. Since they were coming back the next day, I cleaned up the footprints, got Lola and left. I didn't check the house and I didn't call the police. Looking back, I know I should have, but I didn't want my aunt and uncle to think I was crazy. Never let my house sit again and I'd lose all that money. Nothing was missing when they came home and they both claimed to have not had any experiences. I only know this because years after this happened, I didn't watch their house since that time and brought this up over a family dinner. My cousins both have had experiences. One said she saw figures at the end of the long hallway leading to her room. The other said she woke up a few times to dozens of people standing around her bed and then breaking her lamp by slamming it into the wall. My uncle thought she was acting out because she was a young teenager at the time, but she sweared up and down that it was the people standing around her that did it. A couple of years ago, I met this guy in one of my college courses who said he could read people and see auras. He was a friendly guy and I'm generally curious so I would hang out and talk with him between our classes. I started doing some meditation sessions led by him, nothing intense, just very basic meditation techniques. However, I seem to be natural, is what he said. Things like focusing on my third eye instinctually, meditation sessions lasting near an hour but only felt like 10 minutes tops. He started saying you can do a lot more while meditating and naturally, I was curious. So one night, after a long meditation session, I was beginning to ground myself and before coming back, I just thought to myself, if this stuff actually works, send him some kind of message. Fast forward to the next day, I met him between classes as normal and totally forgot what I did the night before because I thought nothing would happen anyways. But the first thing he said to me was, I had some really weird dreams last night. I was in the middle of the dream and all I heard was your voice calling to me and all it said was hello. I was stunned and I didn't really know what to say because the time he woke from his dream was the same time I finished my meditation session about 1am. This didn't really creep me out. I really just thought it was a coincidence because I was and still am skeptical about the paranormal. 
However, what did creep me out is what began happening after this. I started hearing voices while meditating. Weird feelings of being drawn toward these noises and voices. Then, things began to escalate. I began experiencing paranormal activity. This would be a whole other huge story. This did really creep me out, and I decided to stop meditating. Within a couple of weeks after ending my meditation sessions, all paranormal activity stopped. So, what in the heck was this? Any ideas, thoughts, or opinions? I'd like to start meditating again without the paranormal events this time. Thanks all. So one evening, I was woken up by my husband moving against me. Now he sometimes does this in his sleep, or sometimes if he wakes up a bit hot and heavy, he'll move to gently wake me up in the morning in a sexy way. It was still dark out, I sleep with the blinds open, and it was still dark in the room, so I knew it wasn't morning yet and I was tired. I shrugged him off a few times, and then when he kept at it, told him I was tired and rolled over to look at him. When I rolled over... He had this grin that stretched across his face in a really abnormal way. I freaked out and tried shuffling away, but he pulled me closer and laid my head on his chest in a comforting manner, but obviously with me freaking out it didn't feel like that. He then just made three little shushing noises which he's done before and stroked my hair. I was convinced it wasn't him, but I didn't want to look at his face again. I was so scared. It seemed like I stared at the wall in front of our bed for ages before I guess falling asleep again. When I woke up in the morning, I told him about this and asked if he did all that. He said no, it was a dream. And he did notice me getting restless in my sleep and making huffing noises, as though I was crying, but without the tears, so we moved closer to try and comfort me. It just felt so real and so oddly scary. I've had a hard time believing it was a dream. His grin was just not possible and very menacing. It felt like it was the fake version of my husband doing things he would normally do. It just felt wrong. Now I woke up and was dreaming wrong, but I really feel as though it happened. In 2018, I went on a semester abroad in Korea and one of our weekend trips was to visit the demilitarized zone, the DMZ, between North and South Korea. I wanted to go because I thought it was important for me to understand the place I was in better than just a short academic visitation. We drove up in a tour bus and spent almost the whole day going there, being there and coming back. Visiting the actual border of the DMZ wasn't that unnerving. The folks stationed there were very nice, and even though they warned us to mind your P's and Q's, I was still at a relative ease. I knew I had to be very respectful of this space and tried not to goof around or take pictures of too many things. It was really educational and enlightening. It's where the weird stuff begins. We got back on the bus, drove up the road and were invited to walk down the actual excavated third tunnel under the DMZ. There were virtually no animals anywhere around. No birds, no bugs, no wildlife at all. The area is like a grassland with some trees, so I expected there to be some birds or squirrels, or even mosquitoes since it was going into spring. But there was literally nothing except the people who worked there and our tour group. That started to make me uncomfortable, because even at the actual border there were some pigeons and crows. It immediately had my hackles up. There was supposed to be a shuttle that goes all the way down to the armistice clock, but it was being repaired so we had to walk. The further we walked down the tunnel, I felt like I was walking through rising water. It started at my ankles, then up to my knees, my waist, and by the time we got close to the armistice clock, I felt like it was all the way up to my neck. I started walking on the balls of my feet with my chin up on reflex, because I had the physical sensation that I was trying to wade through neck deep water. I didn't notice until my friend asked me why I was walking funny. When I walked normally, I felt like the water was over my head and I couldn't breathe. When I got to the armistice clock, I felt dizzy. My vision was getting spotty and I wanted to turn back. I couldn't move my feet from where I was standing. 
I felt like something was pushing at my chest and all of a sudden, it felt like I wasn't myself. I felt like I was someone else. I looked down and I felt like I was wearing the wrong clothes. I remember thinking, I want to have uniform. I kept trying to push the thoughts away and leave, but I couldn't move. I felt frozen. I was staring at the wall behind the clock. A wall that was supposed to be a barrier to keep people from using the tunnel to move between north and south. Even though I couldn't actually see anything but the wall, my brain felt like I was looking at a woman and her son. I don't know how to describe it. I guess it's like you're not looking at something, but your brain is receiving some information telling you that you are. I felt like I knew them. The longer I stood there, the more people I thought were there. I remember thinking, there were 12 of them. I kept stepping closer and closer until one of my friends asked me what I was doing. I didn't even realize I was moving from where I was originally standing, which was about three or four feet back from the clock. I couldn't snap out of it until my other friend tapped my shoulder and said we had to go back up and get back to the bus. When I turned around and looked at my friend, I didn't recognize her. When I turned around to leave, I remember hearing the woman say, wait, where are you going? When I kept walking, I heard her say, please, don't leave us down here. I wanted to cry. I didn't stop feeling like myself until I got back on the bus to drop off my backpack and stop in the gift shop before we went back to campus. Apparently, I looked terrified. The cashier asked me if I was okay, and when I said I was, she kind of gave me a funny look. I eventually got over it until my friend went to Korea on a semester abroad last fall. They went to the DMZ again, and I asked him if anything weird happened. He told me he felt the feeling of rising water too, and even the weird out-of-body feeling at the end of the tunnel. The tunnel doesn't end until you're past the border, but the end we stopped at was the clock and the wall. If you go further, like right to the wall, you get in huge trouble, and I wasn't going to risk that after already feeling strangely. He told me that there was this film they watched after the tunnel that documented its history. Like when the tunnel was completely flooded to keep people from using it to move between countries. I missed the film because it took me forever to get up the ramp for some reason. I mean, I knew I was out of shape, but I felt like I got hit by a freight train for some reason. So I walked around the museum looking at some photos of the Peace Talk Complex's construction and the different complexes that are around the DMZ like housing for the people stationed there and for workers at the Kaesong Industrial Complex, which has been decommissioned for a long time. So to start, here's a little somewhat necessary background info about me. I'm currently 16 and living with my mother and my stepdad. When I was six, my parents divorced and my parents had shared custody. I would visit my dad on weekends once in a while. So a while after they divorced, my dad started seeing this woman named Sarah, who was a teacher. Cute side note, I refused to call her anything but Miss Sarah because she was a teacher. Sometimes when I went for my dad weekends, he would bring me over there to visit and like two times, I stayed the night there. So my very first time I went there and stayed the night, we arrived and my dad and her were inside talking. They had me go outside to his little playground out back where they could see me through the kitchen window. So I went out there with my little blue ball and played pass with myself by throwing the ball in the air and catching it. Sad. After a few minutes, this other little boy about my age came over and asked to play pass. I said, okay. And as we tossed the ball back and forth, I introduced myself. Hi, I'm Marshall. When I asked his name, he said, and I quote, Hi Marshall, I drowned. Now me being my seven-year-old self didn't understand exactly what that meant. So I said, cool. And we continued to play pass. After a few, I was called back in for dinner. So I said bye and ran in. Fast forward to the next day. I ended up being sent back outside where I met my friend again. I asked him if he wanted to play some pass, some more, but instead he said he wanted to show me something cool. So my dumb younger self followed him away from the playground into the woods nearby, into this little body of water. 
I asked why he was showing me this, but he just giggled, and before I could do anything, my dad started yelling for me, so I ran back, and it was time to leave. Now, after I got home and everything my mom asked how the weekend was, I said everything was fun and that I met a new friend. She was psyched that I made friends there already and asked his name, to which I told her the obvious. I don't know, he didn't tell me, but mommy, what does drown mean? Obviously I was seven, so she didn't explain it and told me never mind or something. But years later, when I was 11 or 12, I remembered the weekend and asked her if she remembered it. And she told me that after I told her what I did, she called Miss Sarah and asked about it. Miss Sarah told her that there weren't any kids allowed to live there because of some freak accident. My mom researched it and found out that a little boy drowned himself. So I was friends with a dead boy. I was 16 years old and already at boarding school for roughly five years. My boarding school was situated in buildings that were originally used as a convert for priests and was also used as a graveyard in the Middle Ages. It's now been around for over 170 years as a school, going through two world wars, during which it was also used as a field hospital by the German army. Now the thing you should know about the boarding school is that it was located in two large buildings separated by a large playground. The boarding school itself was located on the top floors of each building, separated by three floors to reach the ground floor. I didn't have any good grades that year and was moved over to the other building of the boarding school, with the junior years to be under a stricter routine and longer study hours. We always had about one hour and 15 minutes every evening to relax and spend time with friends after studying. For that, there was a large basement with a small TV room with a bar and a gigantic room with pool tables and kicker tables. The thing about the gigantic room was that it only had a single light switch and it was connected to the school theater and dancing room of which the doors were always locked and its lights always closed. Besides that, there was also a door that was always locked and supposedly connected the two buildings on the school's premises with a tunnel. Now that evening, I went down to the basement directly after studying taking along my phone charger. It was a pretty uneventful night and at the end of it, I went up the stairs, going up three floors, finally reaching my room. All of a sudden, I realized that I forgot my charger in the basements and ran up to the supervisor who gave me the keys so I could go down to the basement. Once I was descending the three floors to reach the basement, I started to get this eerie feeling of being watched. The feeling got even worse once I realized that if I would scream, Nobody would hear me, as there were three empty floors between myself and the boarding school. Once I reached the basement level, I was calm again, unlocking the first door and opening the second one. As I slowly opened the second door, it felt as if the darkness in the gigantic room was extremely thick, as if it would swallow me. I know it sounds weird, but that's how it felt. I switched on the lights and started making my way past the ping pong tables, towards the back of the gigantic room, roughly 30 meters away from the door and the only light switch. As I made my way to the back, I was suddenly taken over by a massive sense of danger and terror. I felt as if I was being ambushed or led into a trap and my heart rate skyrocketed. I quickly turned around and sped walked back to the door when suddenly all the ping pong tables were making extremely loud noises as if someone was slamming on them with their fists to stir up a fight. I started sprinting to the door in fear that someone might switch off the lights or close the door on me. And while I was getting closer to the door, the noise got louder and louder. Once I finally reached it, I switched off the light and slammed the door shut. And as soon as the door closed, the noise stopped. I quickly locked the door and ran up as fast as I could, as if my life depended on it, no pun intended crashing into one of the supervisors, making his way home at the end of the night. He asked me what was going on as I was pale, sweaty and shaking and I told him what I experienced. Instead of trying to rationalize what happened, the first thing he said is that he experienced some scary things as well when he had to lock up the basement alone. He also told me to check with another supervisor to make sure nobody was down there. 
The other supervisor and I went down the basement again and stopped at the locked door, trying to hear if someone was down there or if any student was messing around. We listened quietly and heard someone walking around. As soon as we opened the door, the noise stopped and we opened the lights, but nobody was there. Nevertheless, the back doors of the dancing room and theater were wide open. To this day, I get chills thinking back of this experience. Nobody could have been down there with me without me noticing it, nor can I explain away the slamming noises coming from the pool tables. It's an experience that has never left me, and although I try to rationalize it, it's haunting me in a way. What could have been is what I'm wondering now. When I was just a kid, my parents moved into a larger house to start a family. I had an older sister who was around 17 at the time, along with my mom and dad, there were four of us total. My parents decided on a white farmhouse out in the country, with an old decrepit barn and a few outbuildings on the large plot of land we now owned. I remember having really bad night terrors about a tall man made of shadows. One nightmare I still remember vividly after 12 years was that my room was on fire and I was sitting in the corner of my bedroom crying as the tall shadow man stood over me and watched me. Spooky, right? Well, my father used to work the midnight shift for a prison about 20 minutes away from our house. And one night my mother woke up because she heard my dad come back home right after he left for work. So probably sometime after midnight. He walked down the hallway towards my and my mother's rooms. Our rooms were right across from each other at the end of a long hallway and then stopped outside her open door. She claims that she called out to him, but he didn't respond and that she couldn't see him despite having the door open and my night lights shining from out of my room towards the hallway. When my mom asked my dad about it the next day, he said he never came back home. My mother also claims that she heard footsteps when no one else was home. She was a stay at home mother and my sister and I went to school. And that she has felt the bed move after dad left for work. I've had a lot of vivid nightmares at that house, but I don't remember a lot of them. And they stopped happening as I got older. My dad still feels bad about not being able to protect us from the evil ghost and tells me that he used to walk into my room and start pleading with an unseen force to leave his family alone. I loved living in that house though, and I was sad when we moved away. Looking back, a lot of weird things happened at that house, but I never really cared and was more interested in playing with my little sister. I had a lot of nightmares and deja vu, along with both of my parents. I've never asked my older sister about it, but maybe I should. I don't know. I used to sleep in a room that my grandfather used before he passed away. He moved into my house the last two years of his life because he was left alone after my grandmother passed away and needed help being taken care of. Before that, I slept in a garage converted to a room, but we ended up needing the space for storage. After my grandfather passed and his room was available, I moved into his room. When the bed shaking first started happening, I took my mattress off and flipped the bed over thinking that rodents had somehow gotten inside the mattress and I was feeling them run around inside of it. That's somewhat what it sounded like, just lights but rapid tapping of the mattress at many different spots underneath me. I inspected every inch of the bed and mattress but found nothing and nothing on the floor either. No trace of any animal. It would always start happening when I had shut off the lights and as soon as I sat up in bed, it would stop. When I'd lay back down, it would start up again after a minute or two. It got to the point where it would wake me up after falling asleep. I ended up being very sleep deprived for as long as it lasted. This went on for about three months. After the first month, I got rid of my mattress and bought a new one, but the problem persisted. Sometimes out of frustration, I would slam my fist into the mattress in hopes that if there were mice or some type of living creature that somehow had gotten into my mattress, that me hitting the bed very hard a few times would make it stop, but it wouldn't stop. I would also place my hand between my body and the mattress 
to check and see if I was leaving some type of muscle spasms at different parts of my body, but there were no spasms. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what was causing it. When I would sleep on the sofa in the living room, I didn't experience the issue, but the sofa just wasn't comfortable to sleep on. And I would only sleep in there on occasion where I was so exhausted from sleep deprivation that I was able to sleep while being comfortable. It got to the point where I was afraid to go to sleep. I was a grown man who doesn't believe in the paranormal, but I was afraid for whatever reason. I guess it's because it's so bizarre and I couldn't find an explanation after all that time spent trying to figure it out. At one point, I went out of town with my brother and stayed with my aunt for the weekend and it was really refreshing. The bed didn't shake and I slept very well. I talked to my brother and told him the issues I was having at home, but he never had any issues like what I was experiencing. It changed from just an annoying occurrence into something that was scary after I stayed the weekend at my aunt's. Normally when I would sit up in bed, it would stop, but it changed to where it would keep going after I sat up and I could really feel the bed shake and hear the bed creaking as it shook. Below my bed was just empty space. The floor was about six inches below the bottom of the bed. Then one day, it just stopped. I never felt anything out of the ordinary just after one random day that it stopped. But for weeks after, I was still afraid when I went to bed. This happened several years ago, and I still sleep in the same room. I'm wondering if anyone has ever heard of anything like this happening to someone else. I'm 100% certain that it wasn't my imagination. I clearly felt it and heard it for a period of weeks. Every single night and I was wide awake when it happened. It's so weird when I think about it. It took a very scientific approach to try and understand what was happening, but came up empty in finding an explanation. I went to the Haunted Museum with my girlfriend on December 6th, 2020. I want to start off by saying I have a very strong intuition with energy. I experienced many things on the tour. I saw a shadow figure when I thought it was a worker. I saw an apparition of a pale looking lady wearing a black witch hat and some kind of witch robe. I'm a male and when I was using the restroom, my hair was slicked back with gel. I felt my hair lift up almost into a mini ponytail. My main highlights would be that I was in a room, can't remember which one, and while the host was talking, I felt a little hand hold my hand. I'm very intuitive, and I immediately felt and knew it was a little girl. I instantly felt really sad for her. I felt so much sympathy for this little girl, I felt as if she needed help or something. I told my girlfriend that I feel like there's a little girl with us, and I told her that she wasn't evil and she wasn't good. In all honesty, I'm thinking this little girl isn't evil, but she has to be a little crazy to be able to be in that house if that makes sense. Anyway, this part is important to remember. After I felt the little girl let go of my hand, in different rooms she tugged on my pants four different times. It was the right calf at the exact same spot every time. This happened in the mirror room, the second time in another room, and the third and fourth time was within seconds of each other. There's a room where a worker dressed as a clown had to tell us stories and whatnot. At the end he asks, are there any questions? I asked him if he ever felt tugging at his pants. He stops and emphasizes that it's very common in the museum for people to feel their pants being tugged or pulled. He then said word for word, there's a little girl here who's not evil but mischievous. I then told him that I already felt my pants being pulled twice at that point of the tour. The clown jokingly told me the girl must be following me because of my slick back hair. Now here's where it gets really interesting. There's a room before the box. I don't want to name the box for personal reasons. It's supposed to be one of the most haunted items. In the room before the box, there's a video explaining how haunted this box is. And if you don't want to see the box, you can stay behind while the other guests can go inside and check it out. While the video was playing, I felt a soft tug on the exact spot by my right calf. I want to say three to five seconds later, my pants got tugged again, but this time it was with such force that it made me jump in front of everyone watching the video. Everyone saw me jump. 
I had the strongest feeling that the little girl pulled my pants so hard as a warning to not step inside the next room. The next couple of days I couldn't stop feeling sympathy for this little girl. I prayed to God that if she really is a little girl stuck there to please help her. But if it was something else, I just wanted to leave that up to God. So my fiance and I live in a very rural small town in central Virginia, surrounded by towns and counties that are very similar to ours. There aren't many things to do here, so we typically drive around just to get out of the house for a bit. Three nights ago, we were driving through a surrounding county on an extremely backwards road. Very few houses, no other people out, pretty much dead. And we got to a stop sign and needed to make a right turn. Straight across from us was an old house. The windows were boarded up, it was decaying somewhat, and it looked as if no one had lived there for a long time. We both, almost in sync, just stopped what we were doing mid-conversation slash turn and looked at this house. The door was slightly creaked open, it was pitch black outside. The sky was very cloudy, so no stars or moon, and the nearest house was a few miles behind us. And I felt this horrible, heavy feeling of dread come over me. I thought it was just because we were alone out in the middle of nowhere with this scary looking house. But my fiance and I just kept sitting there looking at this house. He made the turn a few moments after. We had probably sat there for three to four minutes at this point. And he told me that he had never felt the way that house made him feel. I scare very easily. So coming from me, it isn't worrisome, but he's the opposite. Now for the past three days, we cannot let go of the house. I think about it and the feeling it gave me constantly. I tried to push it out of my mind, but we both started dreaming about it. If you live in the northeastern part of the US, then you know that a huge snowstorm came in this week. Well, I was at my boyfriend's house and we couldn't find this puppy in his backyard. We kept calling his name, but he wouldn't come to us like he always does. In fear that he somehow got out of the gated backyard, I grabbed my snow boots and ran to the back door that is the kitchen. To note, my boyfriend was standing by the back door looking for the dog, and his dad was at the front door talking to a postal delivery driver. We were the only three inside the house. I put on one snow boot and then hopped from one side of the kitchen while putting on the other boots. As I slipped on the second boot, my foot slipped from under me because my boots were still wet. I landed hard on one knee and my other leg flew out in front of me. I then landed on my butt and knew I was going to then fall backwards and land on my head. At that moment, I felt someone catch my upper back slash shoulders with their hands and then squeeze my shoulders. It kept me from falling backwards and slamming my head against the tile floor. My boyfriend was standing in front of me and had a broken foot, so he would never have made it in time to catch me. So I assumed it was my boyfriend's dad. His dad asked if I was okay and what had happened. I didn't think anything of it and laughed off my bruised knee. Later that night, my boyfriend's mom came home from work and I was telling her how her husband saved me from a bad fall. My boyfriend then cut me off and said his dad didn't come into the kitchen until after I fell and that he didn't know what I was talking about. We even confirmed this with his dad as well, and he stated that he saw me sitting on the floor and came to check on the dog. I have no idea what I experienced or what could explain what I ex experienced. All I know is that I fell hard, and that whatever happened saved me from possibly getting really hurt. I can't explain why I felt someone catch me or why they squeezed my shoulders after they caught me. Could anyone explain this experience, or does anyone have any a similar experience? So this occurrence happened in 2013. I had just started an SSRI that sent me so over the moon that I went into my first real experience of psychosis. There were so many strange things that happened, but let me focus on just one. My neighbor had to take me to the hospital where eventually I was placed on a bed in the lobby area because they didn't know what else to do with me, I guess. Someone, either a nurse or something in my head, can't remember, 
told me to start reading things around me. Maybe to calm me down, I don't know, but I did. I started looking around and reading all the texts I could see around me. Eventually, I looked to my right and saw on the column two safety warnings. One in English and one in Spanish. I read the English one, mumbling I think, and then I started reading the Spanish one. I don't speak Spanish and have never learned, so I was just guessing what the words sounded like as far as I could tell. All of a sudden, as I'm reading the Spanish, I lost control of my body, and an absolute flood of consonants and vowels, sounds I've never made in my life, practically every sound a mouth can make, came flooding very rapidly from me. It was one of the scariest moments in my life because I literally thought, this is the end. Because I couldn't breathe, but I wanted to very badly. I thought I was going to die of asphyxiation. Eventually, of course, it ended. That must have been just the warm-up because something then even stranger happened. Somehow, I managed to fall asleep. I remember the feeling of absolute emptiness like I had never felt before. I woke up to the sound of singing, very pleasant singing, and then I realised it was actually me. Now, I've never been able to sing in my life. I have a terrible voice, and even to this day, I cannot reproduce the quality of the sounds I was making at this time. Maybe my judgement was off and I interpreted my singing as beautiful, but later on, a nurse told me I had a beautiful voice. Maybe she was lying. I don't know. Anyway, it wasn't like I was meaning to sing. It was like my body, something else other than me, was showing me how to sing. It was like I was sitting in the driver's seat of a self-driving car. Hands are on the wheel, but I'm just watching and feeling the car make its own decisions. I was singing what sounded like words, but not in any language I know. One thing that was amazing was the level of focus that my brain was able to do. It's like nothing else existed except for the next note that floated into my mind, and that level of focus made it possible for my body to easily reproduce the exact note in my head with perfection. It really did feel like some sort of perfection. Perfect focus, perfect clarity, perfect fluid execution. I can't make any sort of decisions in this. I wasn't consciously doing anything. I felt more like I was watching my mind and my body do its own thing, able to see clearly how it was able to manufacture the song. I was half asleep, but still able to remember this. I don't remember how that ended, other than later on, I fought with the nurses so extremely that they had to inject me with something that put me out instantly. Two weeks in the hospital after that, but that's another story. I'm a male living in the UK. I'm an atheist and feel that I apply an appropriate level of scepticism about all things in life. I strongly believe that everything must meet its burden of proof before it's to be accepted. Based on how extraordinary something is and how well it fits into the real world, we can observe and test. That being said, there are a great many people that, if you were to ask if they saw a ghost or something paranormal, they would say no. But then after thinking on it for a while, would say actually there is something or things that I can't explain. Something that I wouldn't jump to a conclusion about, but still nonetheless would be unable to explain. I have a few small things that fall into this category that when put together might be worthwhile saying. Starting with my mum telling me that as a baby, I'd look over her shoulder and grin at something, which really gave her the creeps as this apparently coincided with some other weird things happening like stuff being moved. As a young kid, maybe around six, my mum, brother and I travelled to stay with our grandmother, who lived a few hours away. She was widowed in the 60s and never remarried. My brother would take a spare room and I'd sleep in my grand's bed. One morning, I woke up to something digging into my sides, just like when someone digs at their two fingers in either side of your ribs to make you jump. I opened my eyes and nobody else was in the room, my grant was already up and downstairs. I didn't know what to make of it and kind of brushed it off and closed my eyes again. But then as I did, it happened again. This time I shot up and decided that whatever this was, it was time to get up. Being so young, I didn't tell anyone. I just didn't know what to make of it. It had never happened before and it's never happened since. When I was a few years older, 
I had a few experiences where my name would be shouted at me or slowly whispered as I was dozing off and I'd jump awake freaked out wondering who was responsible. There's a condition called exploding head syndrome, not nearly as terrible as it sounds. It's more like as you're going to sleep and your brain starts to work, you can get these experiences which, at least for this, I feel like I can kind of put it down to, but I still can't be sure. One time at school while walking in the busy corridor to my next lesson, someone's hand met my shoulder from behind as they were trying to walk by. Immediately, someone's face jumped into my mind. At that moment I turned and I saw that it was the same kid. I didn't know this kid or have ever spoken to him, I just knew his face from seeing him around the school occasionally. That I really can't explain as I was facing the other way the whole time. Finally, fast forward to the age of about 18 or 19. My girlfriend at the time was staying over at my house and we had to get up early and drive into the city through country roads so I could drop her back at her house and head on on to work for the early Saturday shift. I lived out of town and I was a key holder at work so I had to get going around 5.30 and it was still dark. So driving on the country road, there was some white smoke or fog in the middle of the road. It was kind of the shape and size of a person and there was no fog anywhere else, just localized right in the middle of the road. It looked very out of place, like I'd never seen fog appear that way before. It happened all too quickly and we drove right through it. We both freaked out and she didn't want me to leave for work when we got to hers, but just had to. I do think that if anyone really thinks carefully enough, more often than not, they'll come up with something that they just can't explain. And that's why I find these kinds of things fascinating. When I was approximately 14 or 15 years old, around 1988 or 89, myself and my family had two summer holidays in the Algarve in Portugal, one following on from the previous year. The first holiday included myself, my older sister, mum, dad and uncle and aunt. The second holiday the following summer was with the same people, except my sister who stayed at home. Both holidays were in the same location and both times we stayed in the same villa which was owned by a business associate of my uncle. As such, I believe the accommodation was free and that's why it was a great holiday option for us all. The villa was situated about 15 minutes walk outside a well-known Algarve town called Taviero. The first holiday where my sister was also present was event free and nothing unexplained happened at all. The second holiday was where I alone experienced an absolutely terrifying paranormal event, which has stayed with me to this day. The villa we stayed in was all on one level, as most villas are, and had a pretty standard layout. The main door at the front leads straight into the kitchen, and that leads into the main lounge area. Off to the left and the right of the main lounge were two ensuite bedrooms, where my parents and uncle and aunt slept. I slept on a fold-out bed in the lounge area and out to the back of the property was a small swimming pool. From memory, it was a very nice spacious villa and probably worth quite a bit of money. Nothing happened for the entire two week period that we were there except for the final night of the holiday. I often say thank god we flew home the next morning because I don't think I could have stayed there another night. On this final evening everyone had just gone to bed and closed their doors and I had just finished setting up my bed and finally turned out the lights and got into bed. No longer than 30 seconds after getting into bed, I started to hear tapping on one of the walls. I laid there trying to guess what it might be and just figured it was probably one of my parents or uncle or aunt doing something in their rooms, so I ignored it. I then heard the same tapping again, but louder. I sat up in the bed and tried to pinpoint where it was coming from, and this is how I know it wasn't sleep paralysis, as some people have often suggested to me. Peering across the dimly lit lounge room. It was then that the tapping started to spin around the room, as if the knocking was circling me as I sat there. This was naturally pretty unnerving, and I struggled to rationalise what was happening. It was at this point that the tapping stopped, and immediately, a wooden chair from the lounge room, dining table, made a scraping sound against wooden parquet flooring that it was resting on. 
the sort of scraping noise a chair would make if you pulled it out from under the table to sit on it. At this point, I didn't know what was going on. And being as young as I was, I think fear got the better of me and I shot down into the bed, turned around and pulled the sheets up under my chin and closed my eyes. But unfortunately, it didn't end there. Next, I heard more scraping as dining chairs were being moved, followed by a very quiet but very distinct shuffling noise, which sounded like shuffling footsteps. These footsteps got louder as whatever it was started to approach me in the room. As it approached, I then heard this mumbling in what sounded like guttural low-key talking, but in a language I didn't understand. It certainly wasn't Portuguese. On top of this mumbling, I suddenly began to hear this terrifying rasping breathing, in and out in a very rhythmic fashion. The sort of rasping that someone with severe breathing difficulty would make. The breathing got louder and louder until it was right behind me, right next to my head on the pillow, rasping loudly into my right ear. Petrified doesn't even cut it. I was simply frozen with fear. I don't think I could have turned around even if I wanted to. This loud, heavy breathing continued for what seemed like a lifetime, but in reality was probably about 30 to 40 seconds. And then it slowly faded away and the room was left in silence. I laid in the bed for about another hour, unable to sleep, and listening intently for anything else, but there was nothing. Eventually I fell asleep, probably through nervous exhaustion, and when I woke next up it was 6am and daylight filled the room, and I remember the sheer feeling of relief. The first thing I did was get up and look at the dining table area, and sure enough, two chairs had been moved away from their normal resting positions under the table. And not just by a small amount, but significantly so. I also checked the rest of the communal areas in the villa to see if any doors or windows had been left open, but there was nothing. When my family got up, I told them all what happened, and unfortunately I was met with mainly scepticism, which I found a little upsetting at the time. To be honest, I think the experience affected me to the degree where I probably needed a form of counselling to really process it and help get over it. But of course... Nothing like that was available at the time. I've often tried to rationalise or debunk this event myself over the years. Did a wild animal get into the property and then prowl around doing these things? Possibly, but that wouldn't explain how it would have left again as the property was secure. Or more importantly, wouldn't explain the circling tapping or the mumbling dialect. Was one of my family members sleepwalking? I thought about this a lot too, but concluded that it's just not possible as I would have heard them opening their bedroom doors, which were heavy wood and very loud. And plus there simply wouldn't have been enough time for them to fall asleep, as it happened very quickly after they all retired to their rooms. A few people I've shared this story with have suggested it could have been something demonic in nature, but I'm not sure if that would be true or not. An interesting fact to end on is years later, fairly recently actually, I discussed this with my sister, who then told me that when she was with us during the first holiday, she always felt extremely uneasy sleeping in the villa lounge and often would get up and sleep with my parents in their room. She also told me that she was informed by my parents and uncle that the property which was built on old former wasteland was actually on the grounds of a former mass grave and burial site. This was something they decided to keep from telling me as I was the youngest at the time. I thought that was interesting and depending on what your beliefs are, it could maybe go some way to explaining the strange events that took place. As a result of this experience, I've always been extremely open-minded about the paranormal, and if I'm honest, I've always had a very inquisitive interest in it. I think this is how it goes for most people who've experienced something, and I know they often say that everyone is a skeptic until you experience something yourself. When you do, it changes everything. It certainly did for me. I'm not expecting any it was definitely this type of responses, but I'd be very curious and interested to hear what other people think, and your input and insights would be very gratefully received.